He was about to leave uh, to take up the new position at Georgia Tech. Uh, we, we kind of uh, uh, overlapped maybe a few months. Uh, so his work was mostly on BEC and uh, many body uh, dynamics of BEC, uh, quantum optics, uh, and related work. So uh, here I have itemized some of the things that he has worked at that time, uh, light scattering from tra trapped atoms, quantum field theory, uh, of atoms interacting with photons and, uh, and, and quantum phase diffusion in BECs and how it actually could be detected uh, from uh, in a far off resonant light scattering experiment and also collective excitations and interference effects in, uh, in BEC. Uh, so today he will be talking about uh, ultra cold collisions of fermions and bosons uh, uh, in the presence of spin orbit coupling and, and how that modifies uh, Wigner's threshold behavior and parity conservation effect. Uh, and, and maybe I will also introduce uh, Robin's uh, talk uh, now so that I don't have to come back. Uh, uh, uh. So Robin uh, will be uh, talking about, uh, 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 about some of his uh, early work starting on atom-atom collisions and uh, uh, some of his similar work on photo association spectroscopy, BEC related uh, properties, and also sympathetic cooling. Uh, uh, cooling of the atomic hydrogen by collision with the ultra cold alkali atoms like lithium and uh, atom ion collision. So, Robin was kind enough to provide a slide uh, that uh, sort of summarizes some of the things that he will be talking about, including uh, his early days and, uh, and, and long range uh, construction of long range potentials and the scattering, uh, including uh, charge transfer processes and, uh, and, and hyperfine interactions. So, um, uh, I uh, now give the uh, what do you need to uh, lean? Oh, it's this one. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Bala. Uh, most, uh, I think I'm among the first uh, few ITEM postdocs, but uh, after I left ITEM, uh, there were a period of time uh, due to family obligations. I wasn't able to be as active as I liked uh, in this community, uh, so it's all, all, always great uh, to be back. I think uh, I get my strength. Let me, yeah, let me set things up here. This is new, so I don't know how to use a Windows 8. No. I haven't been able to sleep uh, at all. I mean, being so, I think part, partly maybe because because of the jet lag. But the, the other side is really I'm uh, very excited. So this talk uh, will be dedicated to the memory of a former colleague of mine. I don't know why it's not showing up here. Yeah, uh, many of us know. Uh, uh, Professor Raymond um, Martin Flannery. Uh, he and I, we have a generation gap, so I never got very close to him. But uh, I know deep in my heart, he's a really a, a very warm hearted person. So I can't believe that he's not with us anymore. So I came to ITEMP uh, in sep September 1993 after getting a PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder. S spent uh, three years here, and a few of the important things happened during that time. First, uh, in 1994, Shor's algorithm came, then quantum computation got started. And then 1995, although uh, everybody know, know that they got the both Einstein condensate. I wanted really to do both, but they ended up doing, not doing very well in either. Still, I managed uh, to get a job. I know because I'm with uh, some of the legends uh, 
in this field. So my new coordinates is uh, uh, Tsinghua, I'm in the Department of Physics, uh, in between was uh, Georgia Tech years. And uh, really, I haven't been as committed due, due to family, some of the family obligations back home. But uh, why at Georgia Tech, this is uh, my you know, constant battle with Turgai, one of uh, the Alex former student. So he is really a mentor. I think it's really great to join a new place with someone, a senior faculty who can tell you what to do, what to not expect, and also to tolerate, you know, tolerate me taking the sword at him. And uh, like many of you, I also managed to get some other usual things done. This is my daughter. Last year, we were on the seaside. Uh, here's a new challenge. So since uh, three years ago, we decided that there are so many new interesting things that could happen in cold collision. We built our own condensate machine. And uh, the, this talk will be discussing some of the new things we expect to observe. The title is Ultra Cold Collisions in the Presence of Spin Orbital Coupling. Uh, this work is mainly done by a student who recently finished. Uh, and also in collaboration with Bogal, many of us know his fundamental contributions to ultra cold collisions within the last 10 years. He has really changed the perspective of the whole field. So for the fermionic uh, work, this paper is already published. We have one for the bosonic atoms, which is being reviewed right now by PIO. And another work on the really more complicated issue of scattering within single channels, which we are in the process of uh, writing. So atomic quantum gases, you know, since uh, basically, I think the explosion of this uh, research uh, overlaps with the uh, last 25 years of uh, ITEMP's uh, presence in the community. It owes to a large degree to the simplicity of the atomic interactions at low energies, where Fermi uh, first introduced this uh, contact pseudo-potential. This is some kind of universality. That means uh, all the details are essentially uh, not as important. They're all grouped into a single parameter called a scattering lens. And uh, later, uh, three sort of Chinese physicists introduced this uh, more generalized pseudo-potential because uh, Top one has some problems at the infrared, infrared limit when you adopt this to treat the many body systems. At the heart of this uh, simple approximation is, of course, the effective range expansion. Many of you are here are really the experts. I must claim before I came to ITEMP, I've never done any scattering calculations. The reason for this talk to be on the scattering is because this is one of the things I learned here, uh, essentially postdocs and also students uh, around that time, so sort of I learned from them. So if you look uh, more carefully, this approximation certainly is a very simple-minded universality. It simply means that at very, very low energies when atoms really do not approach uh, to short distances, uh, all the details of this inter interaction potentials simply are absent. We know Bogal's work is that being able to find analytical solutions to this uh, one over r to the sixth or one over r third or one over fourth type of potentials simply means there probably is a more deep sense universality which connects with these uh, potential curves. Uh, this is related to this so-called uh, threshold laws, a big threshold laws that Bala just mentioned, yes? So if we have a short range interaction, we know that the scattering phase shift scales with k to, the, to this power. If this interaction is uh, spherical or symmetric, so you can use a partial wave expansion. So at low energies, k is a collision in momentum, so it's very small. That means only the leading term, which is k to the power of 1, survives. The wave function should, uh, at short distances, have this uh, asymptotic behavior. But even this is uh, only valid when the wave function or the radius 
of the, this interaction is uh, relatively large. It really does not allow you to probe this uh, one of R6 type of potential. We know that this wave function is already goes beyond this uh, contact pseudo potential approximation. In the sense, this wave function shows if scattering length is very large, then at the short distance side, there could be some high momentum uh, effects, which is uh, really related to the, to the important discovery by Shinatang called uh, contact. And this, I will not uh, be, you know, giving you the detail about that here. So now real atoms, of course, are the power law potentials. I know this is a impact on the heart of Alex, many of important contributions on the weak forces between atoms. So for one of our to the m power type of the potentials, this uh, threshold behavior is different, yes. So th those behaviors are important in many of the discussions we will have uh, throughout this workshop, especially connecting, for instance, dipole interactions, uh, interactions between molecular uh, scatterings, etc. yes. So this length scale uh, over which, where this uh, contact sort of potential approximation really works is uh, given here for some of the typical alkali atoms. You can see it's very, 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 very large distances. So if I look at the associated energy scales, which is 10 to the minus 8 to the power of atomic units, this is very, very large energy, much higher than the typical condensed quantum gases energy. So th that you would expect some of these, you know, these short range, these uh, polynomial type of potential effects may will be able to be showing up in some of the experiments, certainly. Yes, this is uh, also in line with the idea that uh, Bugos quantum defect theory can be properly used to describe this type of potentials analytically. So now let's uh, look at the, the, you know, the topic I'm going to be discussing here. So real atoms we have, of course, are not uh, just a single internal state. They could have many internal states. So the contact pseudo potential takes a more complicated form. It's not just a single parameter related to the scattering lens, but it's a matrix. Yes, these FF are simply the spin operators of different internal states. So basically, it means you have real atoms with many internal states. So at low energy limit, if their threshold approaches the same value, used to have several different scattering lenses. In recent years, a uh, new area, very topical, in fact, for atomic quantum gases uh, has developed, which is related to the synthetic gauge field of atoms. That means we try to use these quantum gases to simulate many body systems where gauge potentials are very important because uh, these are the, simply at the heart of so-called topological orders, topological quantum phases. A particular type of uh, uh, gauge potentials I will be discussing is called the single atom spin orbital coupling. This is a, a type of interaction which we now can routinely generate in the lab, and uh, already lots of experiments uh, are addressing this important topic. The idea of this spin orbit coupling is related to the so-called dark state. I know Alan Espad actually is going to give a talk on Wednesday, yes. So you have, if I have two ground states, one excited state, I use two new resident light to couple them, then there is a certain superposition of this ground state called a dark state, which is immune to spontaneous emission. Atoms would be able to go from one side to the other. I couldn't find it. Yeah, atoms would be able to transfer from this side to this state to the other state. If these two Riemann beams are counter-propagating, then when atoms are going flip from this one to the excited state, it gets a momentum recall. Then when it's stimulated to the other state, it gets additional momentum recall. So that means when atom is flipped from this state to that, you get a momentum recall. And this, if you write in the single quantized form, it simply means that atomic momentum is being boosted by a amount which depends on the spin state. This is a spin, sigma x component of this uh, spin one half system, yes. So a lot of groups, as I mentioned already, uh, working in this, uh, the, really, this uh, story started in 2011 
Well, this is JQI in Spearman's group. I think he received a lot of publicity on this. So there are a lot of issues related to quantum manipulated systems. This particular interaction is important. So what I, int I intend to address in this talk is the following. We know that the short-range atomic interaction for real atoms with many internal states or the spinner atoms takes this form. If I simply extend this Fermi contact uh, interaction to multi-levels. Now you can engineer a one body interaction which couples a spin to the momentum. Yes, it's a spin orbital coupling. It is engineering through these Raman processes I just previously mentioned. So now we have a many body system where it, every pairs of atoms are interacting in this way and each, uh, each atom by itself has this additional interaction. When I look at this many body systems is it true or is it appropriate to simply add up these two to consider this as a Hamiltonian of these many body systems? The answer is of course not true. For that, uh, I dig out this uh, paper from Maxim. I think uh, that was the time when we were both here, yes? This is a pioneering work by Maxim Oshani. He did it while he was at ITEMP. Maxim showed that if you have interaction that is uh, to the single atom, that means individual atoms being affected, its Hamiltonian is different, then this could uh, come back to haunt you to modify the scattering or collision behavior. So Maxim in this case considered atoms being confined in a one-dimensional tube, then he did the calculation showed that the atom-atom collisions are actually changed by these single atom interactions. So we may expect this spin orbital coupling being a single atom interaction would also affect atom-atom interaction. All the theoretical treatments so far, already a few hundred papers, simply add up these two Hamiltonian and do the many body study. So we decided that to look this more carefully and uh, if you really look, it's quite surprising. So now let's uh, start with one atom. If I have one atom, this is a kinetic energy. Yeah, for this atom, free atom, then I add a spin orbital coupling. Then if I define this operator, which is the spin direction of, I use sigma for spin one half, projected along the direction of motion, this is nothing but the helicity. So this projection could be plus or minus one. That means uh, the spin one half atom could be projected on the direction of motion or opposite to the direction of motion. Then these two uh, first and second terms, they commute. So you can easily solve this state. So this is a dispersion curve for a free atom. Now with this, that you simply shift to the left, or the shift to the right, you get this branch. An important point that is here is that many of you know that this graphene and the topological insulator is that there is a Dirac cone here. So this is where, where all the interesting physics and the threshold behaviors are we are going to be discussing coming from. So now I, I look at the first the simplest case. This is symmetric three-dimensional spin orbital coupling. So that means I use the spherical coordinate system. We don't have to look at that. We only look at the radial direction, yes? Now, to make the problem even simpler, I consider energy is a positive. So I look at the collision at this energy. The reason I don't want to look at these energies here below is that because you can see that they belong to the same channel state. This is a positive helicity. This is negative helicity. But nevertheless, the scattering could still occur here. So this system, in fact, provides a a really fascinating example of how collisional, collision scattering theory, no, just the on-shell scattering theory can be really applied. So this helicity operator, in fact, does not commute because there's a P here, yes? So it does not commute with any inhomogeneous potential. So if you're in a trap, this helicity would already be flipping back and forth. So I, in order to describe this, uh, you know, so in a graphically sim simple uh, way, I introduce these red arrows, which means uh, the spin direction is locked to the positive direction of the motion. 
this uh, green arrow simply means uh, the spin direction is locked to the negative direction of motion. So that means those two intersecting points in the previous slide uh, here and here simply corresponding to equal energy surfaces in the momentum space, yes? So this is one helicity, this is the other. So for one atom, if it is moving in the presence of a homogeneous potential, its helicity would change. Now, if I come in with this helicity, then I could scatter, remain in this helicity state or scatter into the other helicity states. This would be normally called an inelastic uh, collision, but uh, energy-wise, it's the same. So in fact, if you are in uh, quantum gases with no, no dissipation, this does not lead to any loss. Similarly, if you are coming in the red helicity states, it also could scatter into these two channels. So there is an important important concept issues, which in fact is the reason that led us to first look at this problem. It was widely speculated that in the presence of spin orbital coupling, for both gases, condensation would be condensed at this lowest dispersing energy curve points. So it's termed by condensed matter theory. This is condensation at uh, non-zero moment. But in fact, uh, this is uh, at best uh, ambiguous. Because if you look at it here, although its canonical moment is non-zero, if you look more carefully, it's a derivative of the dispersion curves, curves which corresponds to the, canon to, the, to the kinetic moment. In fact, uh, for both condense, condensated condense, you would expect its kinetic energy to be minimum. So in fact, if you check carefully, this is just the point where its kinetic energy is zero. So it's no, no surprising at all. And uh, of course, there are other surprises which I should not uh, be getting into that. So now let's look at the model system. I'm going to look at the three-dimensional spin orbital coupling. It's a single atom interaction. I look at two atoms instead of one atoms. I also look at the positive energy region where the both channels are open. So this is a problem, you know, one atom, two atom, one atom, uh, spin orbital coupling, the other atom spin orbital coupling, then there's nominal shorter range interaction between these two atoms. You go to center of mass and relative <coughs> coordinates, you immediately find that you get into trouble because these two do not commute. Why? Because the presence of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is not an angular momentum operator anymore. But we can really try to be clever here. For instance, we look at the cold gases, the total uh, center of mass momentum can be zero. And uh, this topic is very popular in China because we are involved uh, in a lot of our research uh, are involved in sort of related to the topological orders and the topological insulator stuff. So this, uh, that's why we have a lot of experience with type, this type of systems. And uh, if I look at the, just the relative motion, you can do a normal angular moment decomposition. You will find a certain selectional rows for bosons and fermions. So I should not get in you much of the detail, but uh, lo simply look at the relative collisions in the, between these two atoms with single atom spin orbital coupling. Then this spin orbital coupling law, it's a spin orbital coupling of the spin diff of these two different spins of the two atoms. But this is really not an angular momentum operator anymore, yes? Nevertheless, it's a, it can be easily diagonalized. You find the eigenvalue. So that uh, eigenvalues give you three degenerate branches, or in fact four. This middle one is uh, in fact a doubly degenerate. Simply corresponding to the difference of the spin operators between these two atoms can take on three different values of projections along the direction of motion. So there is this particular one which corresponds to the projections of these two atoms along the direction of the motion is uh, the same, so they cancel out. This is a normal branch. And these two other branches are similar to the one atom case, this uh, so-called red and the green or the positive and negative helicity branches. So in this uh, three by three systems, the problem can be really solved. I should not uh, 
uh, give you the detail how we solved it, but uh, try to make an analogy how do we do the collisional calculations. So we have the incoming wave, we have a scattering wave, this is a plane wave, this is a scattering amplitude, yes. But this uh, formalism applies when the dispersing for the atom is the uh, free particles. That means the atoms are free, mo free moving atoms. If we don't have free uh, particle dispersion but it has a splat uh, splitting of the threshold, then we know we have this uh, Feshbach resonance. So this would be the situation where both channels are open, and this will be the situation where one is open, the other is uh, closed, where the Feshbach resonance you know, really arises. Same type of situation could occur when we have two atoms with symmetric spin orbital coupling. The total angular momentum is conserved. That means the you know, relative angular momentum plus the total spin of these two atoms. But we have two sort of uh, equivalent uh, basis states we could use when is in the angular momentum. This allows you to make a partial wave decompositions so that you could solve the scattering. But in order to find a scattering amplitude, you have to use the plane wave incident states using this helicity basis. These two bases can be easily converted, transformed using this rotational D matrix. So without doing the careful calculation, you know that the scattering amplitude should be taken this form with two D matrix corresponding to rotating the incoming wave direction and the outgoing scattering direction into respective normal directions you would like. And you can immediately see this give you the spherical harmonics so that the collision could be really have different behaviors. Even S waves could take, a, take up a strange uh, threshold behaviors. So the method we actually use is the following. We could use a really a model potential. Where we solve it, then we take the zero energy limit, and if there's a bound state, we simply properly include that. Or we could use this uh, contact solar potential as maximum or shiny used. Uh, this simply is a beta Pierce uh, boundary condition. We could do that. And this is, again, analytically solvable. Uh, if uh, Bogal is on your side, you can simply use uh, one of our six type of analytical solutions even to get the shorter range physics completed, right? Uh, we have done that. Uh, today I will be reporting sort of really the usual, the, uh, the results in the usual limit where the universality or single parameter contact pseudo potential uh, remains valid. Uh, I know Ruben is going to give a talk uh, following mine. In fact, recently this formalism has been used to treat atom ion collisions. In fact, we have extended the range of applicability of theory up to you know, 10 kelvins, basically a single parameter uh, with a predictive power. So now let me discuss, give you some of the results. For the fermions, in fact, all three dispersion branches, in fact, you can see that in the lowest a subspace, this one doesn't come in. That means at low end collision energies, this channel simply doesn't come in. You have these two channels. So the results are will be reporting will be positive energy. That means the energy above here, where both of these uh, thresholds, uh, both are open. That means above threshold. So these are various processes. You know, you could come in this, scattering into that, uh, scattering into this. I guess. Uh, I'm not going to show the detail. I even have the results. Here are the typical cross sections. So at a relatively high energies, these are the high energies of the basically cold atoms before the de uh, quantum degeneracy. We see these cross sections follow very nicely this unitarity limit, one over our k squared. But uh, at the lower, lower energies, or lower temperatures, or even colder collisions, you will see somewhere here, this is about the recoil limit. Then, depending on what helicity states you are involved in, or into what helicity states you are scattering into, this uh, scattering cross-section could either saturate, like the nominal S wave, or could actually rapidly get suppressed. Since it's all analytical result, you can easily check to see if your calculation is reasonably uh, agreeing with the conservation laws. 
in this particular type of model system with uh, spin orbit coupling gauge field, the parity of the system is not conserved, but the time reversal remains. So for any system with time reversal symmetry, you know that you have to agree with the detailed balance. And in fact, we do. So this is a detailed balance result you can read from the Landau. And from this, we find that the scattering from one helicity branch to the other divided by the reverse processes follow this scaling law. And this scaling law, if there were no spin optical coupling, this should be one. But with spin optical coupling, you will see that there is a preferential scattering into the lower helicity branch, even though the collision is at a constant energy. Now, for spin one half bosons, uh, all three states. In fact, this is a, a doubly degenerate uh, two channels here. Yes, so all three channels are involved, and uh, we can also obtain some of these results analytically. But the formulas are a bit too long to write, so we are going to post uh, the results soon online. And uh, some of the behaviors for some of the helicity channels uh, results are very similar to fermions, but for some other channels, the results are very different. For instance, for the scattering from the normal helicity branch to the lower helicity branch, then you will find some of the scattering uh, cross-sections diverges at uh, very low temperatures. This is OK, because the rate remains a constant. So quantum scattering calculation actually allows you to take this uh, divergence. So this is a graphic illustration of the results for the bosons. So for instance, I have these four channels. Yes. So this one, this is the double degenerate channels, but it's their symmetrical combination for spin one and a half bosons that uh, enters into the calculation. So if you do it for spin one, then it's uh, both uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric could come into play. Then this is uh, the other channel. So this particular channel simply corresponding to atom colliding the helicity, they are moving along this direction, but the helicity is along their direction of motion. For this one, is they are moving along this direction of colliding. They are moving heading on into each other, colliding, but their spin is in the opposite direction to their motion. Yes. So then there is a symmetrical combination of these two channels. So in this case, uh, the results are very surprising that uh, if I look at the incoming they uh, collide in this channel, depending on which channels they go out, you will find the scattering patterns are completely anisotropic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should be done so. So this anisotropic behavior normally does not come into collisions uh, between cold atoms if we are at very, very low temperatures. Yes, because only S wave survives. Although, in the dipolar cases, this could happen, as uh, Mutual and I did uh, many years ago. So now, I think my time is sort of running short. Let me first summarize the results before I say a few other things. So what we have found is that if you induce a gauge field, gauge potential to the cold atoms, then it's very likely this would affect their scattering properties. That means all these atomic gas calculations should be revisited with the self-consistent atomic interactions. This is not surprising because the gauge potentials couple different fields, so it makes the scattering channels, incoming and outgoing channels, to be superpositions. Then it's like a multi-port interference. The relative phases between these different channels becomes very important. Second, the weakness threshold is completely changed you will find that higher than S waves could survive at low energies. This has already been observed, by the way. And then there is a low momentum cutoff. You could really never reach the so-called universality limit, because your lowest momentum now is not limited by your temperature, but instead by this potential you are introducing. So although for the fermions, the scattering remains and uh, remains isotropic, but for bosons or distinguishable particles, the scattering becomes completely anisotropic. The vigorous threshold laws still remain in the sense that this I consider the lowest subspace 
where scattering occurs. In the successive higher subspaces of collision, with the total angular momentum successfully become larger, the scattering cross-sections does become smaller. For the fermions, the presence of these uh, helicity bases scattering shows that the, the appearing symmetries will be different. This is a quite very different from many of the calculations that has already been performed. Then the other thing I didn't have time to really emphasize is that due to the symmetry, uh, parity violating uh, interaction, which is this uh, spin optic coupling we introduce, we find the scattering developers uh, handedness. The scattering now is prefer prefer preferentially to one helicity branch. Because I think uh, how helicity develops in nature is not entirely uh, clear to us now that at least we provide an explanation how parity non-conservation interactions could lead to this. In fact, this is more general than just the results I show. And we know that weak interaction in nature does not uh, conserve parity. And what I did not have time to discuss is the scattering in the low energy limit where they are limited to the one uh, helicity branch, one dispersion curve. This could occur is that because among that dispersion curve, two sides, you have either positive group velocity or negative group velocity. So that means collision can occur in the sense of relativistic particle generation between particle and holes within the same uh, 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 same channel as in the non-relativistic uh, scattering calculations. And we are currently trying to extend this to one-dimensional and two-dimensional systems and look at the anisotropic uh, cases of uh, SOC, which is really corresponding to the situation that is being implemented in uh, the experiments. Although I think uh, even though we did not present those results, but many of these new features, uh, analytical features we discussed should uh, remain. So I think I will stop here, yeah. Yeah, this is a very good question. This implies uh, several different things. First, that means when you are trying to look at the topological phases of uh, cold atom systems, you cannot simply use the interactions, contact interaction as you previously been using, like uh, the suspending dependent interactions. The main reason is the following. This sigma dot p interaction is actually infinitely long range interaction. Because why? it's a single atom interaction, but uh, yeah, but in the center of mass frame, you look at the relative motion. This corresponds to an interaction which is infinitely long range because it's a DDR. This uh, persistence actually gives you a topological effect even at the two atom scattering. The reason is uh, for two atoms, yes, look at the one helicity branch. These two atoms correspond to spin vectors in the block sphere on the opposite end of the block sphere. We know if you map a spin to a block sphere, you're always missing one point, yes? Using sigma phi, use the theta phi representation for spin one half particles when you try to map onto a block sphere. There's always one point where you can not self consistently describe it using the same choice of gauge. So now these two colliding atoms actually sit at these two opposite points. So I don't have time to discuss now, but uh, in fact, at the two-atom scattering level, you already see topological phases. <laughs>